in terms of Japan, China, India, new players face a completely different culture. Are they mature and open-minded enough to cope with that? The eyes of a Brazilian scout and the eyes of a, a scout in Africa or, or Eastern Europe uh, or Asia is very different. We expect them to know their own market in terms of Japanese players. Sun High is, 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 is an icon here in Chinese football. Sun High is on the spot here. In terms of the future, I think if we get the right system, we could get really good players coming through the system. Will we find really good young Chinese talent, but also Indian talent? You can change somebody's life, really, and give somebody the break that allows them to be on the pathway to hopefully superstar. I think within scouting, I think what our global network of clubs has enabled us to do is to be informed. The group model creates a, a huge platform for us to be able to help fulfil a player's aspirations with various stages on their development journey. You know, we're looking for players that can perform at the highest level in the Champions League semi-final and Champions League final for Manchester. But we're also looking for players that will fit within a salary cap within uh, in the A-League and uh, in, in, in Melbourne. So we're also looking at different levels um, across the world. What that brings is a, an ability to create a, a global network and a global knowledge that at any time one of our scouts can inform a decision in any one of our clubs. Australia in many ways has a lot of similarities to England in terms of the, the people, the, the attitudes, the, the passion for, for sport. Cahill, Everton win it right at the death. There's been Australian players in the Premier League, you know, over the last 15, 20 years. And English football is, is huge over here. The football scene across Asia is, is very different. Like Japan, it's historically created really top top players. Then you have the markets like Thailand, which is growing, but it's growing at a, at a rapid rate. They're really learning from, from the exposure that they get to, to English football, to European football, implementing a lot of processes that we're very common with in, in Europe, mainly around the academy area. In the last three years, I've travelled to both China and India we've spoken with clubs out there and on, on one hand logic would say that with populations of over a billion people that there is a talent pool and a, a stock of players and young athletes that would enable those, those countries to become uh, world leaders uh, and, and world champions. I guess in size of population that brings an enormous challenge in aligning a football vision. Chinese people, there is a belief that this is a game that has been around for a long time. So I think amongst people here in, in this country, they always felt like they should be doing better. And then I think on the other hand, is the development of professional sports in China is still at a uh, growing stage. In terms of the professional structure, we have three professional divisions. And then below that, there's a semi-pro. That's the pyramid we have. India in itself, the, the ISL, the Indian Super League, is is still relatively young. I think we're in um, going into season seven now. 
the landscape there is actually quite unique because you have the All Indian Football Federation who sits so overarching above all football. And historically, there's been two leagues, one being um, the I League, completely separate to the one that Mumbai City finds itself in, which is the Indian Super League. The Indian Super League, I'd say, has taken precedence or has taken the greater prestige. It's, it's a, definitely a, a league or a product that's growing. It's a really exciting time to be involved in football in this part of the world because, you know, every year there's, there's huge strides being taken across the board. And, I think in five to ten years you're going to see see a lot more of, of Asian teams, Asian players, and you know it's, it's only going to be a benefit to the world football. What's really clear to me is that you you see world class potential between the age of ten to thirteen uh, all over the world. I think what then determines the, the rate and the, the ability of those players to, to reach a high level is a few key factors that are, that are fairly consistent. I think the, the culture that the player grows up in, I think the society they, they live within and what's valued in that society and the mentality therefore that that gives that player or that family ecosystem gives the player is the first thing. Do it, okay. The second key thing is, uh, is access to good coaching because without anything else, unless you are taught and, and guided in the right way at a young age, whether it be the fundamentals of the game, the skills you don't learn, you then don't reach the next step. Then it's about good enough facilities. For a, a young player 10 to 14, you need enough facilities and good pitches is a, is a key part of that as you develop. The fourth key component is around a competitive program to play games because there comes a point when you are 14 and upwards that the standard of opposition you play and the quality of players you play against, that's what drives your development, best against best. And then the fifth one is opportunity. There is world-class players everywhere at 10 to 14. What sometimes hold those players back is the environment they're in or the access that they've got to some of those other key fundamental uh, components. Football is definitely the most favourite sport here. It's the most watched sports here. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in, in the game. In terms of children, if they want to get involved, enjoy the game, love the game, I would say actually they're more competing against academic aspirations rather than against another sport. The youth development structure is still growing. At the club we, we invest in, we have our own academy. So I in, uh, gradually we want to improve that and hopefully we could uh, have more in-house talent within our club. Cricket still maintains the number one status of national sport. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. But I think what we find is there are hotbeds of, of football interest, football support, and particularly in places like Kerala, in Bengaluru as well, the northeast of the country, we know that that's where a lot of the good Indian athletes come from and talent comes from. In terms of actual interest in football at a grassroots level, it's certainly there and it's certainly growing. The, the, probably the key to it is that we've never had that breakout player, that superstar who has gone on to have a career outside of India. I don't think it's going to be a simple journey. I don't think it's going to be a journey that's going to happen overnight. From the insights and information we understand about the Indian market, this needs to start at a much younger level in terms of the quality of education, football education that young players receive in India. If you look at youth World Cups under 17s, Japan always have a very strong team and in the Asian continent they they're probably the strongest across the board from youth development to up to senior team. I think those countries are with good coaching, with good facilities, with the right competitive games programme and with the right pathways, they have the potential to create world-class players. It, it may not be en masse because the, the culture and the society and the, the economics and the, the football is not in the DNA in those, of those countries yet and you need that. 
But one thing that always sits on top of all of that, I think, is, a, is the aspiration. You need somebody, you need one player to break the mold and to make that step. And I think that then sets, a, sets the vision and the motivation and the momentum for the rest of the country. And now De Bruyne, his favourite little pocket. And in for Chasers, oh, that's sumptuous. What a pretty goal. With all scouts within the, the, the groups, the football group, they have a, a framework really of what the, the ideal player is. And I think you just need to watch one game of Manchester City's first team to see the framework that all of the scouts are working on. From the outset, we would always describe a, a City type player who possesses particular attributes in, in how they play, you know, great tactical awareness, good physicality, brilliant technically. Raheem Sterling finds the bottom corner with utter assurance. In terms of translating that into different markets, it, I think it is more challenging in, in China and in markets like that. But I think fundamentally, unless they're linked into what the head coach wants to do and how the head coach wants to play, you're almost going to have this this, this tension between what the coach wants as a, from a player and, and then what we would describe as a, as a City-type player. I think what we've seen in a market like Japan, for example, where a very similar style of football to, to what we adopt in Manchester, we've seen it can work. What has happened in Yokohama over the course of time since our involvement there is we have a really strong process of the way we work with the guys in Yokohama. The style has been widely lauded in Japan and across Asia in terms of how Yokohama have, have won the title. Once we get the brief of the foreign players they're looking for, we expect them to know their own market in terms of Japanese players. But the interesting bit for us is when they say, okay, we've got you know this number of spots for foreign players. This is the type of player, this is the profile. Let's go out to the scouts within the City Football Group. Last season, when, when Yokohama's top goal scorer um, and number nine, Eddie Gard Jr., broke his leg, and we essentially had seven days to, to find a replacement. Our scouts in Brazil recommended a forward from their market called Eric. There wasn't enough time for him to go through our normal process, but, but we've seen enough in the footage to recognise that, that he was a good player. We recognised he had the attributes that Ange wanted. Eric was signed and contributed significantly towards Yokohama's march to the title. We had a very short time scale to find a replacement and it, and it was made all the more dramatic that our lead scout in Brazil at the time, Carlos Santoro, was undergoing minor back surgery. I think he actually done the deal on, the, on his hospital bed, which shows his level of commitment. But that type of story is very fitting because I feel it reflects the hunger and, and dedication we have as a department to, to support and contribute towards the success of our football clubs. The most difficult thing in the, in the scout market today is there's no place hidden. There's no unearthing a hidden gem anymore. If there's a 10 year old kid in East Manchester that looks like Messi as a 10 year old, they're all over social media. They're always, they're talked about, people know. I think there will always be a clamor for the, the clubs uh, all over the world to try to sign those players as quickly as they can. And our, our job is to try to stay ahead of the game. Sun Ji Hai is, 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 is an icon here in Chinese football. A lot of people also say in terms of players who play overseas, he, he's been one of the best examples for us. And from my understanding, you know, besides being able to perform the pitch, he really integrated into the club in Manchester. In terms of the 
future, I think again, it's a very exciting opportunity for us in this group. We are the biggest football group in the world. We are so well connected um, in terms of football knowledge and expertise. And I think if we get the right system into our club here in China, we could get really good players coming through the system. It's a great opportunity for us and a really um, interesting one over the next few years to see um, will we find um, really good young Chinese talent, but also uh, Indian talent in particular, I think is going to be the interesting one. one, two, three, four, one. The nature of the league and the way it kind of works and the, the kind of, as I say, the spectacle that it, that it delivers. It's exciting as a scout, really, to, to be able to you know, watch a player for the first time, identify that thing that makes them a little bit different. That's going to be a debut for Kevin De Bruyne, their record signing. Watching the player make their professional appearances for, for the team that they were scouted for. Jesus! Well, his first touch was nearly an assist. What a start! As a scout, that is probably the most satisfying moment that, that you can have. Kun is the nickname. It's a debut of Sergio Aguero. One of the learnings I, I've taken from our senior and experienced scouts is that it takes a few cycles of players to follow their journey, to see why those players made it or they, they fulfilled the potential you believe they would had, or where they, where they kind of fell off that trajectory. And then you can start to use that to inform the next cycle of players that come through. Big moment for that young man, the star of the future, Phil Foden. You can change somebody's life, really. Signing is like winning the lottery, she said. And give somebody the break that allows them to be on the pathway to hopefully superstardom. The new face to wait for his debut. Into service. Welcome to the newcomer for Manchester City.